next one. <clears throat> so, it's so nice that we can all be here together as servants. And I really, really believe that the Lord wants to do something for our church. I know that our church... Our church seems to be going through hard time after hard time after hard time. I'm going to be clear. Our church is going through a lot of hard times. And somebody very, very spiritual came to the area recently and he said, I don't know what it is about this area, but he said, Damaken Iblis is the place of demons. Is the place of demons. Yani, yeah, what's happening to your church in this area is the place of demons. And I began to say, is there a place that has no de demons fighting? And is there a reason why this is the place of demons? Is there a reason why our church or this area is the place of demons versus other areas? I think it's something that we need to talk about. Every time I sit with one of the servants, they tell me, Abuna, I'm discouraged. I want to give up. I'm stumbled by the priest. I'm stumbled by this and I'm stumbled by that. And, and there's no doubt there's things to be shaken by. There's no doubt there's things to be shaken by. But the servants need to learn how to be fighters. And that's what I want to talk about today. Servants need to learn how to be fighters. Our Coptic faith, our Coptic faith, our Coptic heritage, were fighters. You know, in the 13th century, there was a time when Rome wanted to provide protection for the Coptic people against the persecution. They said, Rome is going to come in and we will provide protection for the Copts, but just submit under our like leadership as a church. You know what the Copts said? The Copts said we would rather be persecuted and die than give up our faith. We'd rather be persecuted and die than be under the protection of Rome and have an easy way. Because in the church, there's always been a spirit of, of a time when we're fighters. We in the church, we're fighters. And we understand warfare. Now more than ever, we need to be completely aware and discerning of this spiritual war. This coming Sunday in Lent, what's the gospel this Sunday? Who knows what the gospel is? It's the easiest one. What is it? Temptation Sunday. First thing the devil told Jesus is what? What's the first temptation? <laughs> Turn the stones into bread. What is he telling him? You know what Jesus is... What, the devil is telling Jesus, he's saying, take the easy way. You're hungry? You got some stones? Who needs struggle? Who needs warfare? Who needs to be tired? Who needs to be ascetic? Who needs all these things? Just take the stones and make them into bread. The first temptation to Jesus, which you should know its significance, is the first temptation to you is to not fight. The first temptation to you in your ministry and in your service is to not be a fighter. In our church, in our Orthodox church, specifically in our Coptic church, we're fighters. And the devil has never and will never leave us. And until we understand this concept, we're going to continue, we're going to continue to be fought against in so many ways. But we need to build an army. And this is kind of what I told the coordinators last week. And I said, look, if the servants are going to come to the servants meeting, they don't need to come to the service anymore. Lee, because we're here to fight. We're in a spiritual war and we're going to be serious. And this church will not allow devil to fight the way that he's fighting. So first thing is we need to build up an army to arm our minds with the mind of Christ. We need to be the servants. We need to be the church that is 
armed with the mind of Christ. Look what 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4 says. He's speaking to Timothy. St. Paul is speaking to his son, Timothy, the bishop. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That would be us. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You see, the affairs of this life are the distractions of this life. He says, if you've come in to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, don't entangle yourself with the noise and the temptations and the distractions and the gossip and the rumors and the bad words and the bad gossip. Don't entangle yourself in those things. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. The Bible teaches something about the church, and I want you to tell me what it means. It says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. What does that mean? Who can tell me what that means? The gates of Hades, Gahim, should not prevail against the church. What does that mean? Think about the word clearly. I'm going to say it again, and I want you to understand who should be prevailing and, and like, listen to the word. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. What does the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church mean? Who knows? Anyone understand it? It seems obvious, but it's not. The gates of Hades, do gates prevail? When you think about gates, are gates the ones doing the fighting? It says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. The church is the one that is fighting against Hades and pulling people out of Hades into the kingdom of God. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. So who's on the offense and who's on the defense? Like, and I know we're on the defense for some reason. I don't know why. We're on the defense. We're getting, we're on the defense. But that's not what the church, it says the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against the war of the church against it. And this is the spirit that we need to have within the church. We're the servants and we need to be equipped for war. There's two issues. The first one is to be unaware that we're in a spiritual war. And the second issue is to not know who your enemy is. When two people are fighting at home, when a, a married couple are fighting at home, we're arguing and we're all of a sudden we're fighting and whatever and we're at each other's throats. Who's my enemy? Is my wife my enemy? Is my husband my enemy? Are my kids my enemies? Who's my enemy? But what's happening in our homes and what's happening in our church and what's happening in our ministries is we're identifying the wrong enemy. We're identifying the wrong enemy. Peter did something. Peter's the devil. No. The devil is the devil. And the devil is my enemy. And the devil is trying to sever the bond and the unity within the body of Christ. And until we understand that, we, have, we don't know our enemy. And the enemy is dancing around laughing and partying because we're fighting with the wrong enemy. You have all your energy fought against this person or this ministry or this whatever. Two dangers to not realize that we're in war. People are always saying, Everybody's saying, for St. Mark. We're at war. We're at war. Is anyone not aware that we're at war? We should war with each other. The one they're gonna take a piece and put it on Facebook and say, I wouldn't say we're at war with. <laughs> we're not at war with each other. We're at war with who? We're at war with the devil. 
And we, the army of Christ, are armed with the mind of Christ. I have to have the mind and the thinking of Christ. And until I have that mind, I'm fighting the wrong enemy. I'm fighting the guy that is doing whatever or the person that says whatever. La. You're fighting the wrong enemy. What does St. Paul says, say? I'll read it. I didn't, I didn't put it on my PowerPoint. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says this, For we do not war against, what? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Aslan Abu Nida, Aslan this person, Aslan this servant, Aslan this whatever, this. We don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. But why are you fighting against flesh and blood? Why are we fighting against flesh and blood? Today the Bible is telling us in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But listen to this as servants, because this is your job. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In the heavenly places. What does that mean in the heavenly places? You are warring against spiritual hosts of wickedness. So when you told your father confession or you told Johnny, you said, I want to join the ministry, you know what you signed up for? To fight against spiritual hosts of wickedness. And until we as servants arm our minds that we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but with spiritual hosts of wickedness, we're fighting the wrong battle. So what I want to talk about is where the real battle is. The real battle that each and every one of us, the beginning of each and every one of our sins starts right here. It starts in my thoughts. Every thought that pops into my mind, negative, insecure, judgmental, um, blasphemous, any negative thought, lustful, it all starts with a what? With a thought. And until we arm the mind, in the same passage of Ephesians 6, it says you need to wear the helmet of salvation. We have to wear the helmet of salvation. We have to have this mind. Listen to what it says. Proverbs 6 says this. An abomination to the Lord is this. A heart that devises wicked plans. You know the word plans, what it means? The actual original Greek is not plans. That devises wicked thoughts. It's an abomination to the Lord. You and me, every sin that you've committed today started with a thought. Some distorted thinking, and we're going to get to that, but I want you to understand that this is an important war. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5 says this. Listen to this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, these evil thoughts eventually lead man astray from God. So the person that you are angry with, the way that you reached the point of anger started with a one thought. He meant to do that. It was a thought. Came to, whether you have evidence or not, you got a thought. And every war that we are fighting is all starting in the mind. You see, we need to have a mind to fight. The battle. We need to have a mind to battle, and the battle, we need to battle in the mind. And this is where it's really important. Because a lot of us, you're going to be fasting, and you're doing your prayers, and you're going to liturgies, and you're giving to the poor, and you're going out to service. But until you fought the real war up in here, all this 
is going to lead to pride and selfishness. It's not going to lead to anything until you focus on the right war. So today I want us, we're going to discuss a little bit after, but I want us to be aware of these evil thoughts that are leading man to sin, each and every one of us. More and more people are suffering from anxiety, anger, distorted thinking, especially against people you might even be close to, people you might respect. You have thinking, negative thoughts, evil thoughts against people. It could be the person you love most in your life. And all of a sudden, these negative thoughts are building. You say, why is the Buddha talking to servants about thoughts? Because everything that is being manifested in this war, especially against our church, is all starting with an unguarding of our thoughts. And because we don't guard the thoughts, then eventually it comes out of the, the mouth. And this is a warfare that's going to fight against each and every one of us throughout our entire lifetime. And even if we don't struggle to renew the mind, it's going to be impossible for you to overcome sin. I want you to take a second. Think for a second. We're, in, we're going to pause for now. I want you to think of some of the thoughts that are going on in your mind. Some of the thoughts that are going on in your mind about anything, anything that is causing you to sin, and I want you to think, if you believe that those thoughts are truth from God or tricks from the devil. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about what is causing people to even perish. People will perish. People will lose their eternity because they're not fighting the battle of thoughts. People say, I'm not going to church anymore because People in the church are judgmental and priests are hypocritical and it starts up here. And imagine somebody severs themselves from the body of Christ forever because of some distorted thoughts. Take a minute and think about it. Think about what those thoughts are. You want to know what the worst part is? is that the devil sugarcoats your thoughts and makes you think that these thoughts are God. They're coming from God. God wants me to stand up for truth. God wants me to defend the faith on Facebook. God wants me to do, like, whatever is going on in your mind. God is leading me to do something. God is. God is leading me to do. Really? Really? St. Anthony says this. He says, you can't stop a bird from landing on your head, but you can stop it from building a nest. You can't protect yourself from getting the thought in your mind that says, I wonder if whatever. But I can stop harping on it and fantasizing about it and thinking about it and building it up because what's happening is as long as I allow my thoughts, this battle in my mind to continue to grow, what's going to take root is... Sin. What's going to take root is sin. Imagine, you might even get thoughts that seem spiritual. That God is leading you to these thoughts, but you can be under the deceit of the enemy. You might be thinking spiritual thoughts. And the enemy is the one that is leading you to your, down, your downfall. He's planning it. The devil is not a crazy fighter. The Bible says, beware of the wiles of the wicked one. Why? What are the wiles? It's talking about the devil. St. John Chrysostom, when he describes this verse, he says what? What are wiles? What is it in Arabic? What's wiles? The wiles of the wicked one. Huh? Hayal. Whatever that means. Okay? The tricks. <laughs> means wiles. Okay? The tricks of the devil. And what it means is, it says the devil who is skilled in the art of war. Devil mish biedr bil'abit. He's not. Devil plants one on the inside. Your friend. Your whatever. And he starts doing it strategically. The devil is skilled in the art of war and he's an expert in the war of the mind. If you can bridle 
the thoughts of your mind and control them? Do you know how pure you'll be? Often, these types of thoughts are called delusion. The thoughts of pride in one's own progress. You see, the devil can work in your thoughts to make you see that you are very spiritual. And that these good things that happen to you are because you are a saint. Masalan, I'm in an argument with David. And I, my point of view is X and his point of view is Y. And all of a sudden, somebody said, you know, Abuna, when you were speaking, my heart was moved within. I'm a man of God, Taman. Of course. Devil sent me this person. His tongue is dripping honey because he knows all I need to say is because I'm a man of God. Keep going with your thought. Keep arguing with David. Push it to the end because you're a man of God. It's delusion. The number one thing that's going to happen to you in Lent as you're going to liturgies and you're fasting and you're praying and you're starving and you're is delusion to make you think that you are better than you might be. It's all deceptive. So what the church calls us to do is to be watchful. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21 verse 36, Watch therefore and pray at all times. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What is watchfulness? It's when you block demonic thoughts from invading your heart. And that enabling your mind to concentrate on what is needful. So today somebody comes and tells you something that people are saying about you. You know what they're saying about you? Do you know what they're posting about you? Whatever it is. Do you know what's going on? And the mind becomes distracted from what Jesus tells Mary, one thing is needed. One thing is needful. Martha is saying, Jesus, can you have Mary help me? And Jesus says, what? One thing is needful. Her mind is focused where? On me. I promise you, every day the devil is sending you. It's not just the devil. Your own human thoughts are even developing some of these things, but the devil is distorting them in your mind. So you're getting thoughts from your own doing. Your own mind is producing some of these negative thoughts, anxious thoughts. But the devil is taking those thoughts and he's distorting them. And he's giving you a deluded view, delusion or confused view of really what is happening. You have the power, you have the power to overcome these thoughts. Some people say, Abuna, this is how I think. La don't accept that. You've been given on the day of your baptism, we pray on the day of your baptism, that God would open up the senses of your heart. And He'd give you the eyes to your heart, ears to your heart, and that you would have the mind. Do you know that you were given the mind of Christ? St. Paul says, we, not, we should have the mind of Christ. He says, if you struggle enough and fast and pray, you might have. He says, therefore, we have... The mind of Christ. Is your mindset focused on battling in this war with the mind of Christ? Something I've been reading a lot about is thoughts these days. I posted something on Facebook a couple of days ago about um, people who were monks and people who were crammed into this big truck and it was crowded and it was smelled and there was like crates of fish and dirty things and fruit. It was just a mess. And one guy is like, this is like a living hell. And then he said, there's a monk over there in the back of the truck. This is in Greece. And he says, Father, how are you going about? He said, much better. I could actually be in hell. He didn't hear what the other guy said. He says, I could actually be in hell. So it's not so bad. And he says, it's only a two-hour ride and I'm going to get to my destination. And the other one says, are we going to stay in this truck for two hours? This is terrible and it's miserable. And the other one said, wow, I'm going to get to my destination and be able to leave this situation in two hours. But if I were to go to hell, I would stay in eternity. You see how he turned his mind? One monk had his mind focused on 
Christ in the situation that he was in. And another person is in this miserable situation. It's the same situation. But the other one's saying, this is hell and it's miserable. Way out of that. And I want out. Your mind is what can create hell to be a paradise or even paradise to be hell. How many people say, ah, I hate prayer meetings and I hate liturgy, tawila awi, and these hymns or whatever. And we're going to have another servants meeting. We can turn something that is paradise into hell and something that is hell into paradise. Be careful and be watchful over your thoughts. Listen to this. The radio operator on the Titanic kept receiving messages of icebergs ahead. But he placed them under a paperweight on his desk because he was too busy listening to the results of an international sailboat race. He never sent them on to the captain. God is constantly sending you messages saying, there's icebergs ahead. The gossip that you're in is going to lead you to a problem. Are you following God's prompts to fix your mind once again on Christ? I want you to think about the excuses that you make. I want you to think about the complaints that you make at home, in your ministry, about the kids, about whatever it is that you complain about. It's all the root of an unholy mind. You say, Abuna, complaining? They say, yeah. Because how could we have the Spirit of God alive in me? But everything I do is negative or complaining. We have to be careful of these messages that God is always waking us up to, to see. What do we say in the midnight watch? We say, behold, the bridegroom is coming at midnight. Blessed is the servant whom he finds watching. Are you watching your thoughts? What are you turning your thoughts to? St. Anthony talks about the greatest virtue is discernment. Being able to separate between right and wrong. How do you grow discernment? He says it's the greatest virtue. People were saying silence is great and humility is great. St. Anthony says no. Discernment is the greatest. He says why? He says because you'll be able to know the will of God and the heart of God. Where God is leading you in your life. Because we're constantly fighting demonic thinking. And how does it come through the regular practice of repentance? You know when we repent? When do we repent as, as, just as normal church members? When, when is it that we repent? The manam al-karsa, right? Like the day I have to, Abuna, I have to, I have to go to confession tomorrow, so then I repent. But that's not what the church teaches us. The church teaches us that the more you repent, the more you're going to have grace coming inside of you that's going to give you like... Insight into what God wants for your life. But because repentance is not a real practice that we do except for the once every six months when we confess, repentance is what? Uh, we don't have discernment. These wars that are fighting our church today, how discerning are we about what the devil is doing? Blaming people and blaming... I want you to test your thoughts. I want you to test your thoughts. I heard a st like a, an example of, you know, like when we have like the angel of God and the, in the cartoons you have an angel and a demon on each shoulder of somebody. And they're, you know what often happens? The angel and the devil are saying the same thing. They're offering, how do you know which one is from the angel, which one is from the devil? Angel saying, go here because God wants you to go there. And the devil saying, go here because God wants you to go there. And the devil is telling you one thing and the angel is telling you another thing. How do you know what exactly is it that is from the angel and what is from the devil? The devil tells you to despair, to give up. I'm going to drop out of service. I'm going to leave this church. I'm going to give up. I'm not going to fast. Why? Because I'm weak. And the angel tells you, do these things because you're going to have victory. God is going to empower you. The angel of God is going to tell you how much 
to endure and not to be weak. Don't give up. Our thoughts lead us to despair. And the angels are telling us, God wants to give you power. But we give in to the worst negative thoughts. I want you to test your thoughts. What are the fruits of your thoughts? If your thoughts have led you to anger from God or not from God. If your thoughts have led you to division from God or not from God. If your thoughts have led to lack of peace from God or not from God. If your thoughts have led you to anxiety from God or not from God. I want to ask you today, whatever condition you are in your thinking, what are the fruits of your thoughts? Making peace and building love? Or causing schism, division, hatred, confusion, doubt? You see, the devil is so cunning. And you have to know that if all of a sudden I made a thought, I had a thought in my mind and I went with that thought because I thought it was from God. And I reacted to this godly thought. And the result was negative spirit all over my house, all over my ministry, all over my what, family, whatever it may be. Do you think that your thought was from God or from the devil? If I offended people and hurt them and made them feel unloved or feel hated or feel less or more, or, are these thoughts that came to my mind, no matter what truth you're defending in the Word of God, is it having fruits? What are the fruits that we should be looking for? Peace, long-suffering, self-control, humility, repentance, compassion, love. What about impulsive reactions? When I get impulsive, somebody upset me and my next reaction is, go do this to defend the faith. Impulsive. Even Jesus, even Jesus, before he started whipping the animals in the temple, you know what he did? He sat down and he what? It says he made a whip. He wasn't impulsive. Jesus processed his thoughts. He processed, he sat down and he made a whip. And then he turned the temple, knowing very well what he was doing. He wasn't impulsive. Everyone is my enemy. Everyone is working against me. Be careful of these thoughts. So, when a thought says in one's mind, it indicates when a thought stays in a person's mind, it shows that you have attachment to it. When you hold a grudge, when you've been holding a grudge and you cannot forgive for a year, six months, two months, you're holding on to a demonic vessel. If you cannot forgive and restore, you've allowed a demonic tool to take root into your heart and to bring forth demonic, not fruit, I would say weeds. When you reject these thoughts, when a thought comes to your mind, how many times do you reject it? You know how many people came and told me different rumors that are being said? And I said, did you like process what you're being told? I said, no. I heard it several. I said, did you process? Did you use even a little bit of logic? Did you test the thought? That possibly what I'm hearing and the feeling that it's creating in me, it's a rumor and it's very bad. I let it destroy my life. I have to learn how to reject thoughts. I have to need to, to, to know when it is that this is not from God, no matter what is being told me, I need to reject, to live, to make sure that I'm walking in the straight path. What's another way to treat your war on thoughts? You have to have a spiritual father. You know, some people, they don't have anyone guiding them. So their own distorted thoughts keep growing and growing, and growing, and getting worse. Sometimes you need a spiritual father to say, these thoughts are all lies. They're producing in you pride. They're producing in you hatred. They're producing in you the spirit of division. 
Who is your spiritual father and have you sat with your spiritual father yet in Lent? Something to think about. A few questions to ask. Am I afraid to hear what my spiritual father will tell me? If I tell my spiritual father and he's going to tell me that I'm wrong, am I harboring it? Know for sure that that thought is a demonic thought. Meant for your destruction. A few more things. Enter into the battle with faith. It seems obvious. But when you get a thought, do you have faith that Christ wants to fight your battle for you? That Christ wants to empower you with grace? This should be the season in which all day we're just connecting and saying, with my faith, God is going to give me power. God will give me victory. God is here to defend me. God will destroy my enemies. Train your thoughts to be good thoughts. The story I gave of the monk in the truck. Are your thoughts trained to be positive and productive? Today, you, you're going to go home and you're going to find dishes in the sink. And the thought, you're going to say, my husband is so selfish. I went to a servant's meeting. I come home tired. He could have done the dishes. You say, wow, maybe, maybe I can give rest to my husband. Maybe I could... Maybe God wants me to struggle and serve somebody. Look at how God is trying to train me. Imagine if we can try to think productive thoughts. The Desert Fathers talk about that one thought, one positive thought is more powerful than a whole all-night prayer vigil. One positive thought can destroy the enemy. I wish we could be a church of positive thoughts. This is not the power of positive thinking. By the way, this is coming from the Desert Fathers. This is not coming from Joel Osteen or whoever it is that says these stuff. Like, the fathers teach us, think positive, productive thoughts and train your mind. Tom I want you to just try it tomorrow. You're going to go to work tomorrow and see your boss or your whatever or the traffic. I want you to try to force yourself for one day to train your mind to only think spiritual positive thoughts make a habit out of the jesus prayer we are creatures of habit and our brains work as habit so the more you train your mind to say the jesus prayer my lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me a sinner i'm training my mind your mind will have this habit of connecting to god temptation comes my lord jesus i remember when i was young and we you know be watching TV and maybe like a bad commercial comes. We used to be taught to do the sign of the cross. Now we just cover our kids' eyes. What happened to this training of, of, of the, every time I see this, I do the sign of the cross. I call on the name of Jesus. I'm going to end here. But I hope that we can really guard our minds and our thoughts. Because everything that is happening within our church today, is the devil planted very easy in two months here's 500 thoughts thought 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 every single one of them is wrong and if anyone is guarding it they might be safe and if anyone is not guarding their thoughts you might have a divided church or hurt people or people who are turned away you agree with me or not guard the mind guard the mind to know what is from christ and what is not you guys are now sitting in your ministries. You're going to be getting some sheets because I know that we're second week in, in Lent and we may not have made a spiritual plan. So I want you to take a few minutes with your ministry to discuss these sheets, to have a discussion about how we can make a spiritual plan in the ministry for Lent, like for our ministries, and a spiritual plan for myself so that we don't go too far in Lent because once you go through next week and you don't have a plan, then it's just a fast of full and tamaya and carbs. And we can't have that. We can't have that. So everyone turn around with your groups and maybe the, you know, each ministry can kind of conduct this discussion.